Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. This is the weekly recap of all the top stories from Crime Talk for the week of April 8th of 2024, all put into one convenient location for you. I hope you enjoy it. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you next week. Hi, lawyer. 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 First on the docket, what were those inflammatory questions that uh, came out at the Brian Koberger hearing last week that will take place again this week? And remember, the nine reckless and outrageous questions to those 400 people in the county, Latah County, where four students were murdered, according to prosecutors, were inflammatory. And as we learned, a concerned member of the public recorded one of those phone calls and then contacted the district attorney's office to make a complaint. And the uh, prosecutor let everybody know last week when they filed that motion on a Friday afternoon and the judge granted it basically ex parte. Anyway, in the hearing last week, the judge was first very upset. This is shocking outrage. How can you do this? And then the prosecutor walked it back a little bit, and the defense was like, we can totally do this. We didn't do anything improper, and judge uh, will uh, show it to you. And oh, by the way, the jury's already tainted uh, based upon the information that we have. So as you may recall, Koberger's defense team had hired a polling company to assess if the people in Latah County had a negative opinion of Brian Koberger based upon the charges that he has against him and what they have heard thus far, hence the reason for doing the survey so that they can have actual data to present to the court on their motion to uh, request a change of venue. If you go in there and say, judge, there's a whole lot of uh, people that know about this case and a whole lot of publicity and um, we want to change a venue, that's insufficient. You have to provide actual scientific data. So what did the defense do? They were going to provide scientific data. And so the uh, defense uh, team called these people, and now the prosecutor says that all these people are prejudiced. So um, the prosecutors believe that they have planted, the, the they being the defense team, have planted a negative opinion in Mr. Koberger to potential jurors' minds. Did the defense do that? No, they're actually trying to work against that. That's right. Anyway, Apparently, there's a transcript floating around, and we'll take it as true, of the recorded co phone call that reveals the pollsters' um, information and the nine questions that they asked to potential jurors. Here you go. Sit back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if there's small children in the room, close their ears, okay? Here we go. First, have you read, seen, or heard if Brian Koberger was arrested at his parents' home in Pennsylvania? <gasps> No, I didn't know that. Was that even in the newspaper? Oh my God, outrageous. Question number two, have you read, seen, or heard of a police found a knife sheath on the bed next to one of the victims? <gasps> Is that in the public domain as well? Oh my God. Third, have you read, seen, or heard the DNA found on the knife sheath was later matched to Brian Koberger? <gasps> Say it isn't so. Really? Has this been reported anywhere? Where have I been? Question number four. Have you read, seen, or heard if Brian Koberger owned the same type of car reported seen driving in the neighborhood where the killings occurred? <gasps> oh my God. Number five. Have you read, seen, or heard if the cell phone tower data showed that Brian Koberger made several trips near the victim's home in the months before the killings? Is that in the public domain as well? Oh my God, this is so prejudicial to Brian Koberger and the prosecution's case. Can you imagine the taint that's taking place? Six, have you read, seen, or heard if the university students in Moscow and their parents lived in fear until Brian Koberger was arrested for the murders? Oh no. Seven. Have you read, seen, or heard if Brian Koberger said that he was out driving alone on the night of the murders? I can't believe they asked that question. Oh, my God. Eight, have you read, seen, or heard that Brian Koberger stopped one of the victims? <gasps> have you read, seen, or heard that Brian Koberger has followed one of the victims on social media? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, those are the shocking nine questions 
that the defense asked. Completely outrageous. I cannot believe it. I demand the immediate, immediate uh, uh, disbarment of his uh, defense team. Uh, they should clearly uh, be sent to packing, and they should receive a bill for any cost of the uh, removal. No, ladies and gentlemen, no. Okay, I hopefully, hopefully you were able to glean the facetiousness uh, in my voice uh, as it related uh, to these responses. These are all things that have been widely covered in the news media and are actually in the affidavit confirmed by numerous, confirmed by many people in the family as it relates to this, as well as the police early on. This is public information. They're trying to say, oh, yep, heard of that, heard of that, heard of that. And I'm sure there's probably another question based upon what you've heard. Do you believe that you can be a fair and impartial juror in this case? If you think that that is so shocking, assume I'm taking these questions as true. Um, I don't know. I think everybody just needs to take a deep breath and uh, figure out that this is not as shocking and damning as the uh, prosecutor thought it was. I said I would reserve judgment until I heard the questions, and I did. And yes, no, I'm I'm only thing I'm appalled at is the overreaction by the prosecutor in this particular case. So, like I said, Bill Thompson, that's the prosecutor, he told the judge last week that these prejudicial questions have now embedded those 400 jurors. And he said that some of the information in the question is not even true, and some of it is not admissible in court. Well, it's in the news media, ladies and gentlemen. Pre-trial publicity is based upon what's in the news media. Whether it's true or not, it goes upon what is in the news media and what has actually taken place. Anyway, the prosecutor says that the potential jurors are now saturated with that information, and it's reckless conduct, and it's outrageous. Then Mr. Thompson said, hey, I'm not accusing Ann Taylor of uh, drafting these questions verbatim and saying then go out there and give this to the public. He, uh, but he did say that you know Taylor instructed the polling company to draft the questions. Uh, now, the judges are like, well, this is a big deal, and I take it very seriously and was surprised that this was happening. Well, last time I heard, Judge, we don't have to get defense attorneys, don't have to get uh, judge's approval to get the empirical data to support their motion for a change of venue. Um, anyway, the judge said that he may have uh, uh, questions and that, um, that the uh, jury may now be contaminated. Anyway, the judge is going to have a further hearing, uh, decide how to remedy this alleged jury contamination problem. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no problem. If that's all that the 400 jurors have heard about in this case, I would say uh, they've been planted under a rock if they hadn't heard that particular information. Anyway, there you go. Sometimes you have to uh, demonstrate absurdity with absurdity, ladies and gentlemen, and let me know. Maybe I'm the one that's being crazy. That's all public. That's information released through affidavits widely reported in the press. How can you taint the jury with that? That's the whole point of the survey. James and Jennifer Crumley have each been sentenced to 15 years in prison, becoming the first parents to ever serve time over a child's school shooting and what is a unique novel and some say groundbreaking decision. Now the parents were convicted at separate trials in February and juries found them uh, that they callously ignored their son's plea for mental health help while buying him a firearm that he used to massacre four classmates back in 2021. Their uh, sentence will be uh, served. Uh, obviously they'll get credit for the time served already, which is about two and a half years in custody and they will be barred from contacting uh, their son's victim's family in any way in the future. Now, the sentence was read shortly after victims of Ethan Crumley uh, slammed the parents for a lack of remorse, and they pleaded with the judge to impose the maximum sentence, which the Crumleys ultimately received. Now, don't get me wrong. My heart goes out to each and every one of the family members that are victims of Ethan Crumley's crimes. And uh, Ethan Crumley is pure evil. 
And this is a test case, a unique legal theory of holding someone responsible for the crimes of another person that they did not know they were going to commit. And when you start convicting people on what they should have done, well, that starts getting into a much lower standard of proof than someone can being convicted of knowingly doing something. It is a legal standard of negligence being reduced to the criminal courts, a standard which is usually used in civil cases. Simply, is it more likely than not that something happened versus not a vague, imaginary, or speculative doubt, but a doubt that would cause people to pause in matters of great importance to themselves. And I've said this before, and some people don't like it, but I will say it again. This is a dangerous precedent. I hope that I'm wrong, but it'll probably be affirmed on appeal because somebody in the appellate courts will say, well, you know, the law's there. The jury did it. We don't want to seem like the bad guys. This was a serious case, but I hope the appellate courts take a look at this, ladies and gentlemen. Like I said, I have no special place in my heart for the Crumleys whatsoever. They're, you know, not great parents. In fact, terrible parents. But beware when being a bad parent becomes a crime. It could come, I don't know, knocking on your own doorstep. Maybe a family member, a friend, perhaps. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. They're basically saying, under this unique novel theory, the parents knew or should have known that something bad was going to happen, okay? Not that they knew it was gonna happen, like, hey, Ethan, here's your gun, go off to school, Good boy, right? Even a reasonable standard has to be reasonably foreseeable under a civil law. Like, is it reasonably foreseeable if you don't shovel your walks within the 48 hours that the city gives you to shovel your walks that somebody could slip and fall on those walks that aren't shoveled and they turn to ice? Yes, that reasonably could be. One could say, oh, but they gave him a firearm. It's reasonably foreseeable that he could go and shoot up a school. Well, is it? Has it ever happened before? Has he said, ooh, I'm going to go do this? Not, ooh, here's a couple of drawings from a kid, you know, seeking attention. Don't get me wrong. It's a horrible case, but it's going to make a horrible case on the law. There's, uh, I think it was Mama Pink, one of our mods sent me a case the other day where a teen driver who had had two accidents, the victims of the second accident were absolutely appalled that this kid still had insurance and that his parents were letting him drive after the first accident. Well, my goodness, it's reasonably foreseeable that if your child was involved in one accident, they could be involved in another accident. Oh, guess what? They're actually looking at charging the parents in that particular case. I understand, ladies and gentlemen, it feels good. I get it. You want justice for those four victims of Ethan Crumley. You have to look at the bigger picture sometimes. And yes, it doesn't bring you the relief you want. And those parents are never going to get what they want. They want their children back. And the parents, it may make them feel good, but it accomplishes nothing in the sense of this. Is it going to deter anybody? I don't know. I doubt it. If you're a bad parent, are you going to say, I'm not going to listen to anyone's parenting ideas anyway? I mean, think about it. Here in Colorado, we had the Columbine case. The parents weren't prosecuted for not knowing what was going on in their basement, right? One would say, how could you not know that your child was making explosives and uh, planning the first of many, many of uh, school shootings out there, ladies and gentlemen? Now the parents were shunned, and I guess the, the new word of the day would have been canceled, but the parents weren't charged in the Columbine case because we in the legal system until now, try not to hold people responsible for conduct that they didn't do or knowingly engage in. I know, bring it on, let me know how I'm wrong. I get it, that's okay. That's just my thoughts on the matter. I wanna hear your thoughts as well, let me know. Next, the remains of Dylan Rounds have been found. That's right, when Dylan Rounds, uh, went missing about two years ago. He was 19 years old and he was a farmer from Idaho who had planted his first crop there in Utah. Now, local investigators along with the FBI found skeletal remains presumed to be that of Mr. Rounds in a remote area of Lucen, Utah. 
uh, about a 200-mile drive from Salt Lake City. Now, this is according to the Box Elder County Sheriff's Department, and the family has been notified that a plea deal has been reached as of last Monday after a um, month of negotiations. And that, of course, is what led to the recovery of the remains. Now, the uh, individual, Mr. Brenner, is the uh, man who's been charged with Mr. Uh, Round's uh, death, was a squatter uh, living on a a trailer near Mr. Round's property. Now, the 60-year-old, who the deputies charged with Round's murder last year, led detective to the remains yesterday as part of a plea deal. And obviously, that will give him some sort of deal where he's probably going to spend at 60 years old, still the rest of his life in prison. So I'm happy for the family that the matter is resolved. Obviously, unfortunate situation. Nikolai Mew has been found guilty of first-degree intentional homicide of a 17-year-old young man after he was uh, surrounded by the gang of teens while tubing on the Wisconsin River. Now, Mr. Mew more than likely will spend the better part of his uh, life in prison. He is 54. And... um, like I said, this stabbing goes back to an incident that took place in September of 2022. The victim of the stabbing was Isaac Schumann, and um, that was on the Apple River there in Wisconsin. Mr. Mew is facing up to 60 years in prison. The now convicted killer was also found guilty of lesser charges of stabbing and injuring the four other teens, three boys, and a young lady. Now, Mr. Mew sat in silence with his head bowed down as the verdict was read. And um, the jury was only out about one day. The trial lasted eight days, and there were about um, a three dozen witnesses that uh, had taken the stand. Now, Mr. Mew was a Romanian-American engineer, and he had claimed self-defense in this whole entire incident. And the, uh, the whole thing started when he was searching for a friend's lost phone in the river when he was falsely accused by these kids of being a pedophile. They thought that he was taking photos of the young girls as people were uh, intertubing down the uh, river. Well, then they, uh, there was a video of the entire interaction, and it showed the teens heckling Mr. Mew before he ultimately pulls out a Swiss Army knife and started jabbing them. Now, of course, he was attacked Uh, But you know what? He could have stayed over there on the other side of the river. And that's always the problem in these type of self-defense cases, ladies and gentlemen. You best be the innocent victim, all right? Yes, you don't always have to retreat, but if you are the initial aggressor, then you do have to retreat in a lot of states, and it gets complicated. What advice have I given so many times over the years? Let it go. Let it go, ladies and gentlemen. Let it go. Is it really worth spending the next 60 years in prison? Probably not. Now, Mr. Mew did testify in his own defense. Obviously, the jury did not believe him. Problem with his testimony versus his initial statement? Well, he had to admit on the stand that his original statement to the police was not truthful. That's tough for a jury to basically say, trust me now when I lied before. Just another good reason to keep your mouth shut, ladies and gentlemen. Next on the docket, Richard Allen's attorneys don't want to have the jury hear about his alleged confessions. That's right. You know, I the joke oftentimes in our offices is, is why are we going to let the uh, facts get in the way of a great defense? And that may be what's kind of taking place in the Richard Allen's case. They got all this great stuff about this Odinist stuff, and the, the police didn't do this and didn't do that, and they got a million things going. And um, then they forgot one little thing. Oh, that's right. He may have confessed several times. Not once, not twice, but multiple times. Now, like I said, it is um, alleged that Mr. Allen made uh, some incriminating statements to both inmates as well as correctional officers during his time uh, while he was waiting in prison for his uh, double murder trial to begin. And uh, needless to say, his attorneys want those so-called confessions suppressed uh, due to uh, claiming Mr. Allen was in a state of psychosis. Now, 
If you don't already know, Richard Allen is accused of killing 13-year-old Abby Williams and 14-year-old Libby German near the Monon High Bridge in Delphi, Indiana back in February of 2017. Now this case is scheduled to begin on May 13th after lots and lots of uh, legal maneuvering on everybody's parts. But we've covered that in other videos and we're not going to do it today. So there have been reports that detailed how Mr. Allen reportedly admitted to killing the girls during a prison phone call with his wife, but his attorneys have repeatedly claimed that Richard Allen was under physical and mental duress at the time of his statements, and therefore they can't be trusted. But this wasn't the only time Allen allegedly made some incriminating statements. A new pleading reveals that Allen also reportedly made further confessions to guards and inmates during his stay at the Westville Correctional Facility. Now, Mr. Allen's attorneys are pushing for these confessions uh, to be suppressed. However, they stating in their motion that the uh, poor conditions Allen was kept in compounded his deteriorating mental health state. And the defense attorney said these so-called confessions were the result of psychological and mental coercion illegally directed against the defendant and therefore were involuntarily given. Now, Mr. Allen's attorney said that their client was kept on suicide watch during the majority of his stay at the Westville prison and that he was exposed to some of the harshest conditions that even the most heinous of convicted offenders could not have endured. Now, it should be noted that the uh, judge, Francis C. Gull, felt that Allen was being treated actually better than most inmates during his stay at the Westville facility. Needless to say, the prosecutors are pushing back against Mr. Allen's claim that mental health duress um, was responsible for these statements by stating that uh, Mr. Allen didn't begin acting strangely and such as eating paper until after his alleged confession to his wife on the phone. Now, once again, Allen's attorneys go on to claim that inmates were stationed outside of Allen's door to spy on him and keep logs of all of his actions, statements, and behaviors. The attorneys say at some point these prisoners were pulled and replaced by uh, correctional officers. Now, the alleged poor conditions he was kept in exacerbated Allen's mental state, according to his attorneys, and according to them, Allen was battling depression throughout most of his adult life. And during Mr. Allen's stay in prison, the attorneys claimed that Allen's medications were administered in a less than consistent manner and fashion as well. And the attorneys also pushed their claim of inmates and prison guards being in the prison tied to this Odinism. Uh, this claim is tied to the attorney's alternative cult killing theory. And uh, due to all these compounding factors, Allen's attorneys argued that any confessions their client made were not really confessions and they were not voluntarily made due to the toll uh, his captivity had on his mental health. The attorneys further argue that these reported confessions include Allen telling an inmate that he had molested Abby and Libby before shooting them in the back. The attorneys point out, however, that the autopsy of the victims doesn't support this allegation and the girl's cause of death being related to a sharp, blunt object, not gunshot wounds. Now, Mr. Allen also reportedly expressed sorrow to another inmate over molesting Abby, Libby, and others, which he specifically named, apparently. And again, the attorneys pointed out that these allegations, falsities of this confession by stating the autopsy, the girls was absence of any evidence that the girls were sexually assaulted near or prior to their deaths. So obviously the judge will have to decide. There usually is a hearing in open court as it relates to a motion to suppress. Once the defense raises the issue that in a confession was uh, obtained illegally by government actors, then the burden then shifts to the prosecution to prove by clear and convincing evidence that they were uh, obtained legally. Now, obviously the issue here is, was there any government action? Obviously an alleged confession to his wife uh, by Mr. Allen, no government action there whatsoever. Stating that inmates were stationed outside and took copious notes and then ultimately prison authorities did that as well. Uh, maybe government action if they can actually prove that but once again, it's not like somebody was beating Mr. Allen 
to the point where he's saying, I'll say anything. My prediction is that this motion to suppress will be denied. This is a question of fact for the jury to decide the credibility of Mr. Allen, uh, the circumstances in which the alleged confessions were made, and the jury uh, needs to consider the source of the information. If it comes from inmates that's saying, oh, he did this, but there's no corroboration to back that up, clearly the prosecution may not call those witnesses at all if they don't believe that they are credible. So, you know, when it comes to jailhouse snitches, be very, very careful indeed. Um, lots of people have mental health issues, but they don't necessarily uh, start talking about it on the phone with your wife or with other inmates. Hence the uh, rule that everybody is told, keep your mouth shut. Don't talk about the facts of your case with anyone other than your attorneys, because anything you say to anyone can and will be used against you. That's right, including your wife. So we will have to see um, when the uh, trial commences, but I anticipate we will hear all about this um, information at trial, and uh, we'll just have to wait and see uh, where it goes. My prediction, motion to suppress denied. Let the jury decide.